The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Your clients may want different things from retirement, but share a common need, income. Challenger's innovative lifetime income options are designed for today's retirees. With guaranteed regular income payable for life, regardless of how long your clients live, Challenger's lifetime income options help to manage longevity risks in a way many other investments can't. Help more clients do more, live more, create more. Contact your Challenger BDM or visit challenger.com.au forward slash portfolio dash outcomes. For a retirement portfolio that can deliver more, read and consider the Challenger Lifetime Annuity, Liquid Lifetime, PDS and TMD from challenger.com.au. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. Uh, excuse my voice if I'm a bit croaky or if I manage to cough. If Kieran doesn't uh, edit out one of my coughs in between time, trying to uh, get over the flu down here in Melbourne, it seems like just about everyone, Jordan's nodding his head. Just about everyone you know has got the flu at the moment. It's a horrible place to be. Uh, we've got the pleasure of speaking with uh, Jordan Vacker. Uh, planning solo, Jordan, is your is your business. Um, yep. Just saying you've uh, got your own your kind of podcast going with with Nathan Fradley, and uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll bring that up. That that's doing a bit better than than what you thought it would at this stage. You're on a podcast talking about a podcast. There you go. <laughs> well, the snake's eating itself. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's fun. Challenge the standard. Uh, we just talk about stuff that interests us. Uh, so we expect to have maybe two or three listens. Uh, and we've had a few more come through than we expected. You, you, I mean, you would have this as well. You get comments that you get messages come through about stuff you've talked about, and it's it's really nice. It's it's I say to you earlier that Ensemble or back in was X Y. It's helped catalyze I think as community of advisors that maybe we all felt a bit different or a bit isolated before, and now we've got this community and flowing out of that's been all these really great arrangements and relationships. So. Yeah, it's been really lovely. That's it. There's a whole bunch of people that if it wasn't for the Ensemble Network, you know, you know, you and I and others, we would have probably never crossed paths before. Um, so it's yeah, fan- fantastic. So planning solo, like what, like what's in the what's in the name? I know a little bit about your business, and I'm sure probably a lot of people that are listening have have heard you and seen some of your videos and stuff that you do do. But tell us a bit about the name. I know I understand it's a it's a bit to do with the the type of people you're working with and the type of type of advice you're doing. But you know, what's that all about? Yeah, very much so. I mean, naming a business is one of the hardest things I think yeah. I, I deal with. Uh, it's not it's something I always struggle with. But the clientele that I really like to work with are individuals, sort of fifty to sixty five, that are going through a really big transition in life. They're really nervous and they're really inexper- uh, inexperienced with money, and they are facing a solo life. They're facing a life now completely on their own that they have to take responsibility for. And so that, you know, we had to use the word solo somewhere uh, and it's all about planning. Like everything we're doing is planning out what the what the next 90 days looks like or the next two years looks like and what the next, you know, the rest of their life looks like. So it seemed to be a good a good mesh that worked well. Um, there was another suggestion, I, I, I was, what was it? Uh, I had somebody tell me I should call it the newly single business. <laughs> that's, I don't think that's something that I can put on the internet. I don't think that's going to go very well. Uh, Google would end up like a game. dating site or something like that. Swipe it'll get a lot right. That's not quite what you were going for. <laughs> won't get the kind of attention we really are. So, like the last time you and I caught up a, a while back, um, you were you were kind of going around talking to lawyers, essentially like divorce lawyers and 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 and, and that that kind of thing. How did that go for you in getting your business up and and, and running and kind of getting you to where you're at now? Can you talk a bit about what that's been like? Yeah, I think there's there's two aspects to that. The people I talk to a lot are family lawyers and estate lawyers. So we do a lot of conversations, a lot of networking and, and that kind of thing. I think socially, professionally, developmentally, it's been a really good experience. I've learned a lot, met a really a lot of really good people. Commercially, it's probably been less successful than I would have liked. Yeah. Um I think I think lawyers can be a little hard. Our service is very optional. It's very discretionary, I think. Uh, and for lawyers that are in the midst of the the fight or they're in the trenches, it can be hard to to look up and bring in a discretionary service. 
So it's been really useful. And we've been engaged. It's been really good. But the bulk of the work I'm finding is coming through direct marketing. Yeah. You know, mm, okay. The social stuff we're doing, the the, the content stuff. Yep. Yep. And, and so talk me through what a typical engagement with one of your clients would look like. You mentioned like 90 days and two years and all that. Like, that's interesting to me. What's it? What's a typical engagement look like? So we have, there's two channels. There's sort of the estate side and the divorce side in, in broad strokes. Normally, I'm engaged at the start of the process to help people get a clear idea of the pool in divorce. So define the pool, do the disclosure research, get an idea of what the numbers are. Uh, and then we step back. The lawyer takes, you know, they keep running with it. And then we pop in when they start talking about settlements or they start talking about negotiations. You know, the lawyer says, we think you're entitled to maybe 60% of the pool. Have a chat with Jordan. How can that 60% work really well for you? You know, you're 47 years old. Superannuation might not be a priority, but having your own home may be. So that kind of balance. Then we step back again. It runs its course. We check in occasionally, but we just get sort of engaged for the work that we do there. Then we come back in when everything's finalized and we help, you know, we've got this pot of money. What do we do with it? You know, we want to buy a house. We want to do this. We want to do that. So it's kind of three stages they're very much we build for the work that we do in each stage, and then we step back. That final stage, about half of them become ongoing clients, and we work together for a while. So that's the divorce side. On the estate side, it's similar, except you don't normally have the dispute aspect. Normally, we've just got people that have finalized the estate. They're often being the executor. There's a pot of money here. I don't know what to do now. You know, I've got an SMSF that I have no idea about. I'm the director of a company that I've signed documents for for years, but I have no idea what it's about. So a lot of other, you know, untangling and getting things sorted out for people there. And again, we just, we just built for the work that's done. At the end of it, it becomes a really traditional financial planning process where we do check in and, you know, how have you tracked for your 90 days, your 12 months, et cetera. Yep. What do you, can you, can you talk a bit about what you're charging? Like you're kind of talking about stepping in and stepping out. Is it like on an hourly basis or you say for this part of the project, we'll charge it $2,000 or $5,000 or $10,000? Can you give us a sense of what that's like? I, I can tell you that I haven't got it right. Uh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, so we have the first engagement. Yeah, we call it an exploration meeting where we just get to lay of the land. We, we yeah. get to know everything about it. That's four ninety five, including GST. Yeah. Uh, that'll come with a summary note to them just explaining where we're at and a proposal. If it's, we kind of do have fixed packages. So a settlement analysis, for instance, that's $3,300 plus charges. Um, for a negotiation aspect, we'll do an hourly rate. Um, and then the final advice at the end, our minimum is 5500 just to get everything wrapped up. Yep. Um, I think I didn't want to do a lot of hourly work, but we're doing more of it than I expected, simply because we're dropping in for like a two-hour meeting or a discussion, yeah, okay. and then we're dropping out again. So we'll charge for those two hours, and that's 440 an hour. Yeah, it's certainly a work in progress. It's not something that I feel confident I've nailed. Yeah, but I, th I think you're a long way towards that fixed fee charging for your time type engagement than the broader financial advice industry is as, as well. Like you've you know, you've been pushing that that fee for service model for 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 some time, and you know there's people call it fee for service, but there's kind of there's fee for service and then there's fee for service as well, and and you've been pushing that for quite some time. I get. People are calling up from time to time, or I don't know how the conversation comes about when when people are they're going through a divorce in particular, and they're saying, "Well, how do I know which assets to take in here?" Like, are, are you are you getting involved in that type of discussion at all, or is it or is it, hey, like you mentioned before, you're entitled to sixty percent of the estate. Here you go, here's your assets, and then and then off you go. It's kind of a division. So when, when I'm brought in after the things have been finalized, then it's very much, well, I've got 60%. What should I do with it? Yeah. I think where I can and advisors can add a lot more value is earlier in the process, where it is, I've got this array of assets. They've all got a financial value. My lawyer says I can get 60%. How do I do it? And that's where we get to do some really cool stuff. Like, you know, they're 47 years old. They've got a superannuation fund or they've got two investment properties outside of super. They may have the same numerical value, but they don't have the really the same value. There is a prioritization that goes into that. And that's where a lot of the advice stuff that we all do falls into place. You know, what are your goals? What are your priorities? What are your concerns and fears? Yeah. And that then feeds into that advice. And it's essentially investment selection advice almost because you're just saying, yeah, you've got all this stuff. Here's what it's really worth to you. Of the two, I recommend you take X. Yep. Yeah. Do you, do you somehow... Is, is that just a conversation you're having with them? Do you somehow document that? Like what you can introduce them like a supporting note? Yeah, like the the pros and cons. Do you say, well, if you do you ultimately leave it up to them to decide what they what they want, but 
but kind of articulate the pros and cons of of each option. Yeah, so we I've given out quite a few reports where it is very much pros and cons of each one, and then we will provide direct advice. So in an SOA, it's like yeah. here are the assets you should keep. Um, yeah. We record all meetings. All meetings are being transcribed, so we have a very solid foundation for I'm um, recommending. Um, mm-hmm. My team and I have a file note we run for each client where we just back and forth advice and information and then get everything documented. Um, and also, I'm really, I think we'll talk a little bit about being self-licensed in a sec, mm. but I'm independent as well. So that was a big driver of going self-licensed. And so part of that is so I can say to lawyers, I don't really care. Like, I have no vested interest either way. Like, I don't have a dog in the fight. Just from what your client has told me, here's what I think they should do. And I think with lawyers in particular, I think that carries a little bit of extra weight, which has helped. Yeah, I was going to ask you to comment on that. I would imagine, uh, you know, because a lawyer's used to just charging a, a fee for service, an hourly rate, however they they come up with their particular fee schedule, the the way that you're operating your financial advice business is very similar to how I imagine that a lawyer would. Yeah. Surely that helps you in the in the type of work that you're doing, the type of people you try to work with rather than hinders you. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, bless lawyers. Like if, if you get an opportunity, send your invoice after a family lawyer's invoice, uh, you will get paid a lot quicker. Um, <laughs> it makes your invoices look a lot less painful. Uh, I think it, it is that having a similar structure and a similar approach. And it's, it's been a feedback loop because I have modified the way that I've worked to fit in with the way lawyers work. But I think being able to speak their language a bit more, spending time around lawyers, I actually quite like hanging out with lawyers. Like, <laughs> Yeah, personality-wise, they kind of fit what what I find quite funny. Um, so that's helped. But I think if you are going to specialize in whatever it is, you need to be able to talk the talk around them as well. And I think that's been quite helpful in that regard. Yeah, yeah. How did you end up specializing in this in this space? What what drew you to it? Well, a few years ago, or well, back before we met, plants. I think yeah. I think we 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 have a similar chapter in this story. Um, I was ready to leave advice. I was finished. I thought I was bored. It was very one-dimensional. Uh, and Brian, my former business partner who now runs VA Platinum, we engaged the coach, Baz Gardner, and sat down with him and got to talking about what I actually liked about advice and what I disliked. And I worked out that what I liked was the people that you got to work with, particularly people that trusted me. I found that trust was the main currency that I got out of my work. And then we looked at the clients, and I think it was seven or eight of my top 10 favorite clients were divorced women in their 60s. And we just talked about why that was, worked out that I was seeing them after they'd made a lot of mistakes. So how can we get involved earlier on yeah. and try to avoid those mistakes, but also avoid this sort of huge psychological damage that comes out of an unhappy divorce that hasn't been handled very well. There's a lot of self-recrimination. There's a lot of damage that's left behind. So if we can get ahead of that, you know, there's a huge benefit to helping people have a smooth the path into that. So yeah, that's... That, Got focused in that, realized how little I knew, so I started talking to people, kind of rediscovered advice because there is so much scope in advice that I wasn't aware of if what yeah. we can do as advisors. Yeah. yeah. And then you started getting inquiries from people, oh, look, I was happily married, but they've passed away. Will you work with us? And I kind of realized it's the, the clientele that I love working with, not the actual transition itself that was the yeah. niche. Yep. Yep. And similar. They're ending up in similar kind of positions, maybe slightly different circumstances that they've ended up there, but but either way, there's a traumatic event that they're having to deal with and and come out the other side. So then you so then you you went off to finish, essentially set up your business to to do to do this um, on your own. Like, can you talk about the setup of your business? Are, are you still on your own now in terms of advice? Like, what do you? What's so still on my own in terms of advice. Uh, so the structure is I've got. Planning solo licensing, that's my A for sale. Uh, when you know, we very amicably separated, I set that up. And look, a, a large portion of it was a lot of my decisions have been made out of spite. I didn't like not being able to say I was independent, basically. Yeah. I, I said, no, 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 I want to do that. I, it's not a judgment on anybody else. It just irked me that I couldn't. So I went down that path, applied for the A for sale. It went really smoothly, got it within, I think, four to six weeks. It was really good. Then the business is myself and my assistant of the old business has come across. She's now office manager runs everything, and I have two other VAs that work under her, yep. uh, and that's us. Nathan yep. has now joined as an as a AR, yes. so he's now an authorized rep, which is quite quite good, and I reckon that's probably about as far as I'll get yep. to go. It's it's very manageable. That's interesting. So you started with the self-licensed and then built the business on top of that rather than what I imagine would have been the other way around. I think, the more I think logical my, way. Most people tend to, oh, I did, did, as we were saying before we pressed record, 
it seems to be the people that lots of people get disheartened with wherever they're working and they go out and do their own thing. That happens a lot in financial advice. Go and start their own business. But then they get licensed from someone. They start to build a bit of scale. There's one advisor. There's two advisors. There's support staff. And then have this idea that they want to be self-licensed and control it a bit more themselves. But you've done it the, the opposite way around. Gone to get self-licensed first before you even had the business to 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 provide advice. And and there were some economic aspects to that. Like I I tallied up sort of when I was paying in licensing fees with my former licensee, and tallied up how much I paid in licensing fees over my career. And I realised that I'm reading all the compliance material anyway. I'm keeping up to date with the RGs. I'm reading Africa decisions. How much harder could it be and how much more expensive could it be? And I think being, you know, being consistent around reading the compliance stuff has made it a lot easier. If that wasn't part of my you know, DNA or brain, I don't think I could have done it. I think the path you've just described there is far more sensible if you're not that kind of compliance dork. Yeah, because um, yeah, I think it would make a lot more sense. Yeah. And so how is it? how has been operating your own license like a head, a head has it been okay? Has it been a bit of a headache? What, what, what's your feeling? Yeah, they're positive. I, like, I think it's been really, really good. Uh, yes. You know, the advice I give is very vanilla, so I'm not doing anything outside the norm. Um, you know, we are small. Like, I'm not doing a huge volume of business. So, yeah, we have all our files are internally audited by one of my team. Uh, we have an external auditor come in. He eyes a pain in the neck because you have to pay a stupid amount of money for something that hopefully is very unlikely to pay. Mm. Um I got to pay the ASIC levy a few months ago. That was that was a, a joyful experience, paying something with a six in front of it. Um, how do I put it? On the scale of not having to do with licensing at all to paying somebody else to do it, I'm in a really sweet spot, I think, and I'm really pleased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you seem to enjoy it. It, it fits with you and your personality to to be yeah. really controlling your, your own destiny and the, uh, yeah. is it the independent part's a big thing for you. Um, yeah, I think based on some of the compliance meetings I've had in the past where it just became shouting matches because what was being said wasn't logical and I wasn't consistent with the act and it was about someone else's opinion. And that just, you're right, personality-wise, it's not a great fit. So do, you, do you use any of the, like, these kind of outsource compliance type groups, like there's the principles community and I don't know, I think IWF has one and there's a few of them around. Do you use any of those types of services as well? I use an external compliance support group. Uh, so yep. once a year they come in and they audit you know, your five to seven files and they, yep. they give feedback and they check out compliance documentation. That's it. So I don't, I'm don't. i not part of any of the communities that I think are really useful and really positive, but I yep. haven't needed to kind of have built a community and a network that I'm really pleased with. But well, yeah, built your own, yeah. Built, <laughs> built your own around the, around the people you end up hanging out with. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's maybe talk a bit about the the marketing thing you mentioned earlier on in the podcast that doing the door knocking with the lawyers wasn't wasn't quite what you hoped it would would have been. I'm sure it's been fruitful for you nonetheless, but maybe not mm. quite what you were hoping for. Can you talk about the um the marketing exercise that you've been trying over the years? To otherwise, so the most effective I've done in terms of effort I've put in has been other advisors. So I think I did an ensemble podcast a couple of years ago, talked a bit about it. Mm. And that's kind of just ballooned into a lot of advisors getting in touch and helping them out. And occasionally I'll send a client, you know, standard three, I think in the ethics left a lot of people unsure where they fit in. So quite a lot of people would refer when they were conflicted out. So that's been quite good. Yeah. Uh, very, very little effort. I mean, it's just been a really great part of the community. Um, this year I'm all in, like I'm just, I'm spamming LinkedIn essentially and all the social networks with the podcast with Nathan is talking to advisors, you know, where advisors talking about that. I've got a 30 part podcast series that I'm finishing up now, which is two widows for the first three years, networking, trying to get out to people just to get the message out there about what we do. I can't say which of them has been the most effective, mm. but probably blogging has been really good for me in the last couple of years. So just writing consistently, just SEO has been really powerful. Yeah. And are you posting the anything you're writing, is that just primarily just going on your website and that's keeping your website fresh? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, not at the moment, but we'll start getting the transcripts up there. But the goal was once a fortnight and we'll stick, I'm sticking to that fairly consistently. Yeah. But then I see, you know, the stuff that you're doing on, mm. on TikTok and repurposing all that content, that seems amazingly effective. Like that must be really driving a lot of activity for you. 
Mm, it is. Yeah, 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 it does. And you enjoy it. That's the main thing, right? Yeah, that's it. Well, you need to start from, I think that's a bit from, you know, whatever whatever marketing exercise it is that you're doing, you know, if it's the blogging part, you're, you're, you're enjoying that. That works for your the way your mind works and you know, getting your thoughts out. It doesn't matter which what, what you choose to do. It's just do something and, and do it consistently. And then and the doing a podcast and recording some videos of explaining things, like it all helps. There's no – you're never going to be able to point your finger at one particular – if you're only doing one activity, well, then you can point it and say, well, I'm doing that one activity. That's where the clients came from. But when you're doing a few different things, they're just going to come from from all over the place. I think you also find, and I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on this as well, is that I have very few people opt out after they meet. Like after that first meeting, people tend to proceed because they've filtered themselves in earlier on from the Mm. stuff that I've put out there. The people that meet us in that first meeting, they're not going to be surprised by the kind of person I am, I think. I imagine with your content, because it is so personal, it must be the same. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You get a sense of, and you need to, the thing that I've, and you kind of get this already, but just talk about the types of clients that you want to work with. And so you're in this you know, divorced, widowed kind of world. So you're going to be writing about whatever those challenges are. Uh, and, and then someone that's not divorced or widowed, they are they might stumble across your page and say, well, Jordan's not for me. Yeah. Great. They're not going to waste your time booking in an initial meeting or waste their time. They're going to, self, they're going to self-select. Yeah. What's the, the, the 30 part podcast thing that you're doing? Is that, is that just you talking on a topic each time? Are you interviewing people? What are you doing? Thank God not. Uh, thank God no. Um, it's mainly guests. So it's it's the first three years after they lose their partner. So it's sort of the red light decisions are what are the really critical things you need to do right now? So I've got a stack of estate lawyers come in and talking about what's probate, you know, what does being an executor involve, what's estate planning supposed to look like, all that kind of really fundamental stuff. Because the vision I have in mind is that somebody's driving away from their late husband's advisor's office or accountant's office and going, I don't like that person, but I don't know where to turn to. I don't understand what they're talking about. So I want them to be able to refer to this kind of thing. So red light is all that really critical stuff. Yellow light is kind of recovery rebuilding. So this is the middle 10 episodes. And then the final 10 episodes are the green light, which is just building that new life. So that kind of final chapter will be like, you know, a stylist. It will be a travel agent, all those kind of things that people can let themselves be positive about. The middle chapter is we've had a few advisors come in and they're talking in there as well around financial confidence, um, talking about what to do with kind of you've inherited a business, how do you run a business. So it's it's really about just an end-to-end kind of journey through those first three years. And I capped it at 30 or else, you know, you've got that pressure to just keep going and come up with topics. But yeah, 80% of them are with guests, thankfully. It's not just me talking to camera. That's fantastic. I reckon that's going to go so well for you. How do you... How are you planning on promoting it? Uh, it well, yeah, because we've got four episodes out now, so it's yeah. sort of playing around with LinkedIn, mainly on Facebook. I feel like that's where my audience the yeah, to okay. be, and sharing it. We're doing the editing, so then we supply the guests with the social tiles and three or four clips and the, the audio. Yeah. So just trying to leverage, leverage off that as well and yeah. just hopefully be a useful resource. Have you tried a Facebook group? Have you tried setting up a Facebook group? So part of my thinking was that I don't have a big enough community as yet to do that, but I wonder if that's right or not. I reckon that I reckon it'd find yourself. It's like like Glenn James has these studies of my millennial money and all the rest of it, and he's just had. I've had this idea kicking around in my head and say it out loud now. Someone's going to steal it from my podcast. <laughs> but anyway, he he's kind of beaten me to the punch. I just never had the time to get around and do it. Like he's he's built like a retirement. Yeah. Um, uh, Facebook group, and there's a there's a few of them around. It's not it's like it's not as if it's a new idea. But someone someone on my content said, "Oh, you should join this thing and go in there." And it's just like the numbers of people. It's just this kind of self fulfilling thing. I don't know, it's twenty, thirty, forty thousand people that are that are part of it now. The, the numbers are massive in a, only a short period of time. I reckon there's an you could do that, and it's not so much about. People that know Jordan, sure, it, it started off like that, but you're going to have to curate a bit of a community. Mm. And I reckon it'd eventually be it, it, it would be self, it would fill itself, I think, and, oh, I and think that that. that would be yeah. massive. I reckon that's a massive opportunity for you, the face like a Facebook group, because exactly that that demographic that you're targeting, they're all on Facebook and Instagram. Mm. Um, a lot of a lot of them would be on TikTok too, to be honest, but. 
Facebook group would be interesting one for you to explore. It's it's kind of in the middle distance. It's it's been an idea. I thought we'll get the podcast series out, see if we could use that to build a bigger audience, and then roll into that community idea because I think it's a good way to deliver value at scale too. Right? Like, yeah, you can deliver useful information. Yeah, we're very clear about where the line of advice is, but I would say that in my work, fifty percent of my work would be corpse act advice. The rest is not corpse act advice. So yeah, it's. Yeah. I think there's a big opportunity there. So, you know, I'll take that on board. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Because then you can just do the, like, as you're releasing it, you just drop it in there one a week or however often you're releasing it. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm just, as I said, it's been swirling around in my head for a while. I went and registered a Facebook group a little while ago, but I've never actually done anything. <laughs> done anything Who's got the time? It. Yeah, that's it, <laughs> juggling too many other things. So, so what? So what's next? You, it, I think you, you said before, you think you, you said it just, just you being in the advisor for for planning solo. Obviously, Nathan's operating on your on your license for the stuff that he's doing. Is there a bit of crossover between what the two of you are, are doing? Yeah, there yeah. is. So he's he's focusing on divorce, estates, and aged care. Um, he's we have like this matrix we talk about of technical versus emotional complexity. He's in the high technical complexity, high emotional complexity quadrant. I would be in the low technical, high emotional quadrant. So there's a really good overlap there. Yeah. We. Just did an episode on the PY, and I kind of expressed the fact that I'm. It's not been on the horizon yet. I can see it coming. I'm kind of reluctant to head down that path just because of the risks that we all know about that are involved. But I do like the idea of bringing on a junior or an associate and, and skilling them up in the way we like to work. Um, yeah. So maybe that's in the in the future. But for now, it's just head down bum up and just keep helping the people we're helping. Yeah. With. Yeah. How many years in are you to planning solo? Uh, two and a half now. Is that all? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you'd only for ages. What? Tell me about it. No, no, my my grey hair and wrinkles would suggest the same as well. Well, about a year or year before I went out on my own, I was really exploring the divorce market. Yeah, okay, right. yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you've been advising for years. Tell me so, about it. It's nearly twenty years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I've known you for a long time, and yeah. and. I just assumed the whole way through, obviously wrong now, but I just assumed the whole way through you were doing this whole divorce thing. But it's in this in the in in the time that I've known you, it's only recently it's it's recent. The prior business was a very traditional big aggregator of businesses. We bought a stack of practices and we were building a big book, it was all that kind of thing. Yeah. The Royal Commission happened, blew that apart, it took us a while to unwrap that. In the meantime, I'd already kind of lost a bit of faith in advice and um, yeah, then we went down the coaching path. So I think you and I have known each other for a good couple of years, but mm-hmm. I reckon the first year or two of that was me just working through with Baz and saying, what the hell am I doing? Yeah, um, you're doing yeah. The, the door knocking bit at the start. Yeah. yeah, Which is hard, but it's been great. Like I've got some really good friends out of that now. But yeah, just commercially, it's it, it hasn't been a fountain of, of work that I expected. Yeah, but enough coming through now from social channels or wherever else. Yeah. You've got some interesting projects on the way, so I'm kind of keen to... Keen to hear how that all goes for you. Yeah, the podcast yeah, is going to be an interesting one. My wife and I sort of we agreed at the start of the year. You know, the, the kids are seven and three, and I've been very much a part time worker. You know, trying to be home a lot more. But this year, it's kind of turned around a bit and just gone all in on the on the business. So hopefully, it all pays off. Yeah, in a couple of years time, your younger one will be at school, and then all of a sudden, you'll have a bit more time. And yeah, just that evolution that we all go through with young kids, isn't it? Yep, enjoy it yeah. while you can. <laughs> Good. Thanks for joining me, Jordan. Appreciate it. No, thanks for having me, James. Interesting business space that you're in. I think there'll be a lot of value there for anyone that's that's listened. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, mate. Thanks for having me. It's always good to chat. Thanks.